There we go. Okay, so tell us your name and uh, how long were you working with the Course in Miracles before you came to live in community? Uh, Christian Het, and it was right at five years okay. before I came. Okay. And uh, basically, how has it been helpful to you to live in community? Why is it different than just hanging out at home and reading The Course in Miracles? Yeah, well, it's <clears throat> really, uh, if you want to go deep into your mind, it's not even close, really. Uh -huh. um, and I, I know for me, <clears throat> I realized after I'd been studying The Course for just a few months that I was, I had actually heard Ken Wapnick say something about this is about, it's not about making a better life in the world. It's about undoing the belief in the world. And that just really struck me. And I knew at that point I was going to follow it all the way out. I didn't know how I would go about that. Um, but I just trusted it. And um, it was about another four and a half years that I worked by myself. But I would say after about three and a half years, I got introduced to David. And um, I realized that he and I weren't reading the same book instantly. Um, and he had taken it all the way, and he was the first person I had ever been introduced to. Uh, and it was just through a video um, that I realized he had taken the course and followed it all the way out. And, and so I had a job where I was able to listen to him for eight hours, eight hours a day, literally. We just, I just walked around with earbuds, and I downloaded every MP3, free MP3 that I could get of him talking. Actually, I went out and bought a little MP3 player specifically that was dedicated to David. And then after uh, several months of doing that, um, I drove up to Kentucky to do a weekend with him and was actually asked if I wanted to come to the monastery. Uh, I, I heard on Friday, Friday evening, tomorrow, go and ask about volunteer positions. And uh, I just, when I walked into that Kentucky retreat, I just, I could tell that these guys were doing something different. You could just feel it like this deep sense of reverence and peace that I had never experienced before in my life. And I, you could just feel that there, they were taking steps to undo their mind that I had just, I didn't realize existed. So um, I literally was told go and ask the next morning, Saturday morning. I went and talked to Kirsten, and she said, oh, well, you have to do three weeks, you know, uh, th which was their their rule at that. She was just telling me what their rule to be a volunteer was. And so I had a lot of relief because it was, oh, Jesus, yeah, that, I didn't. Uh, I felt like I was hearing wrong. It ended up where I heard perfectly, um, but I was kind of glad, okay, I don't have to go this deep into it. And, uh, but that wasn't the plan. Um, actually, Carrie felt like, after some talks with Carrie, she felt like I was ready to come to the monastery, unbeknownst to me, and she told David, and then David asked me if I wanted to come. So, um, two weeks later, I quit my job, and a week after that, I was in the monastery. So, <clears throat> I would say, uh, I just told these guys the other day, I mean, it's like, I've undone lifetimes in the last few years. Okay, how did you know, you said you could see right away that David had taken it all the way. How did you, how could you perceive that? Uh, it was just a deep inner knowing. I could, I, I just could tell, it, it, it was like, he was, his answers were completely different than any other course teacher I had ever heard. It was like, the, the thing that tipped it off right away was most course teachers just answer a question very directly and it's like and it always involves oh you just need to forgive or and David's answer started somewhere out around Pluto and kind of wrapped around you know Jupiter and Saturn and Mars and then and you don't I, I was just like the first few questions I heard him answer well, why aren't you answering the question and whenever they landed it was like a haymaker um, to the ego it always landed just squarely, and, but the ego couldn't see it coming. And it wasn't until I thought about it or heard it again how really it was just a massive undoing of everything that the question entailed. 
So it was much deeper than any other um, answer that I'd ever heard. And it was just a knowing. It was just a knowing and a recognition. Okay, I know you, when we were talking earlier, you told me that, however, despite that, there were moments where you didn't trust David. So what was that about? Either tell me what happened or why didn't you trust him and how did you get back to trusting him? Well, um, yeah, it's, it, this is a walk of trust and ultimately we can't hear spirit all the time. So we have to trust those that have taken steps in front of us, even though it sounds sometimes like the most insane directions and uh, because it goes against everything that um, that the ego thinks is um, um, I would say um, sane. And so <clears throat> with with David, um, yeah, what I found was that everybody eventually comes to a point of mistrusting either messengers or David because we can only see the mistrust in our mind. And so it's going to go somewhere. <clears throat> it has to go somewhere. And so what the ego, ego describes as practical um, really is not considered practical or or conducive to undoing the mind here. And so I had to walk through, as everybody does, these deep steps of mistrust. And then eventually you just realize, okay, I can only see my own mind. I can only project my own mistrust out onto, um, onto the world. And when that starts hitting home, then I started pulling my mistrust you know, away from form figures and realizing, ah, it's ultimately my mistrust of following this path all the way out, my mistrust of hearing spirit, my mistrust of, you know, what it takes to go all the way. So, <clears throat> How long have you been in the community? Uh, it's been right at three years. Three years. Yeah. And would you say that it has helped you? Because you said even before you joined the community, on that Friday evening you heard, go ask them if you can yeah. join the community. Um, has the voice of the Holy Spirit strengthened in you as a result of your work here? Oh yeah, <clears throat> I've, been, yeah it's, I've done more work in, I would say in the first few months than I did in the previous five years um, by just studying by myself. It's not even close. It's Yeah, I would say I told David the other day I had so much gratitude because I'm, if it ended today I've undone lifetimes and um, yeah. So you had told me <clears throat> I know about you that you've you've said that your blocks, a lot of them were anger, angry blocks. You had to release a lot of anger. Uh -huh. um, what was that like? How did you do that here? Well, we have what's called expression sessions, so it's just a time to come in and really let those emotions fly. And I'd never done that. I was pretty much repressed my whole life. So uh, what I've seen is that that one we come in as new volunteers, there's, there's the surface level emotions that have to be released, looked at and released because we don't even know they're there. We have no idea really. So many of them are so deeply buried. And it's actually the thoughts that we want to get to and then underneath that the beliefs. But ultimately we haven't even looked at those emotions. Um, so the, that's the first thing that has to come up. For, so for me there was tons of repressed anger that appeared to have to do with my dad and my mother and you know job situations and lack and just uh, so that's the way they came up for me initially and um, and then I could start moving into the deeper um, things after a few months of just really letting the emotions fly and not being judged for them it was just like insane to my ego mind how can you know I'm going to be judged for saying these things and I said some of the absolute worst things that I could say, and um, I was never judged. I was always met with love, um, and that's why it's such a huge speed up, because our brothers are reflecting this love that has to be in our own mind back to us, which is really the undoing. So it, here at the community, we use our brothers in two ways: to come up underneath us, to give us that support, you know, that reflection of love, and then also the mirroring of our mind, the mistrust, 
um, the reasons for the anger. And then the ability to be able to just speak it is, it's, yeah, I would just say, I don't know where else in the world this is going on, but uh, it's at not many places. Yeah. And just for an example, underneath your anger yeah. and all the things you thought it was about, what did you find? You said under there is deeper stuff. In yeah. a word, can you tell me, or in a few words, tell me what was under there? Yeah, I can, all that uh, anger? Yeah, I had a good experience that just kind of showed me real clearly. Um, in the middle of this anger, I, I remember one time I, I was working on the campground project with Lila, and I had lots of anger with Lila. And so I remember I just allowed it to come up one time. And I saw myself going to do what I've done a million times, to tap it, to put the lid back on it. And I, I don't know why, but something just said no. And I let the lid come off. And it was volcanic, the rage that was underneath. And Jesus actually says, um, even a slight twinge of annoyance is a thin veil over intense rage. And so that rage, I just allowed it to come. And it came, it was like spindle top. Uh, and it just broke loose and it was about 10, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. It was just raging, raging. And in the middle of the rage, <clears throat> I saw it had nothing to do with Lila. It appeared to be a rage against my dad and I just allowed it to continue. It wasn't like I was going after it. It was just almost unstoppable. And then and the, when I saw it was had to do with my dad, then after that I saw it wasn't even my dad. It was something much, much deeper um, yeah, uh, it was the rage, the rage. It's like we, we appeared to tack it onto physical things, um, but I saw it wasn't Lila, then I saw it wasn't my dad, and it just became the rage. And Lila allowed me, she was the form figure that allowed me to experience that rage. And, and at the end, I just, I heard a hugger. And I stood up and, you know, I had a lot of, I would say, you know, I felt a lot of hatred for Lila at that point. And, but I heard hug her and I stood up and I hugged her and I just started crying. It was, it was so, it was, it was the, one of the most unbelievable experiences I've ever had because I could feel like this huge amount, a big chunk of my ego just fell off. And you, uh, it's, it's the same with guilt. It's never my guilt. We're always dealing with the guilt and we just peg it onto a form figure or a situation. I've seen that over and over and over. Like you, you know, with this accident, it's the same thing. It is the guilt. And this is how we have to allow it to come up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and for anyone who is going to consider coming to live in this community, what advice would you give them? I would say that it requires a deep knowing and lots of willingness just to question every concept because everything we believe is going to get thrown in our, in our face. It, we don't set it up that way. But the thing about this place is there's only one purpose. In the world you have, uh, the other day I was looking at purposes just for jobs. It's, the ego has thousands of purposes just for job, just for a job. Such I mean, as, we, just, just list. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I have to make money, um, I need to pay for food. I like the girl on the third floor, so if I want to take her out, I have to make money in order to take her on a date. I mean, it's endless. It's endless. I like Mercedes, so I have to have my job in order to buy a Mercedes. I love to vacation. And in order to be able to, you know, it's just movies on and on and on and on. And that's what the ego does with every single thing in the world. You know, if you want to go to girlfriends, you can look at a thousand different reasons the ego has for having a girlfriend purpose. So the ego doesn't know what purpose is. Here, there's one purpose and it comes up underneath every single thing we do. It looks like I have a job building a house. In all actuality, it is what the form looks like in order for me to heal um, these wrong-minded thoughts. So that's the one purpose? That is the one purpose. It comes up underneath everything, healing. <clears throat> so, um, when you switch from all the ego purposes to this one very focused purpose, healing, it's going to drive everything that isn't that in front of it. And so what do we do? We go out and have accidents and vehicles so we can look at what we truly believe. 
And then we come to expression and we say, this is what I believe, bam, bam, bam. So we can see in front of the group what we believe. And the reality is the group reflects back to us our sane mind while we're in our insanity. And it's such a massive speed up. That is the undoing of these insane thoughts. And it's just like, it's just like that. And it's so much that we don't even realize it until we begin. You know, we've been through many, many, many expression sessions. And yeah. you know, you're sitting out there and you're on the computer and you see Dave's teachings and you can just feel it, you know. You know, and there's a whole lot of people out there that ha resonate with it. And the other thing that I've, I've seen is the, the ego comes in after that deep resonance. Uh, the ego comes in and will throw things in front of our face like um, um, my mother got sick right before I came. You know, it's like just one thing after the other. Or um, I feel like I need to make a little more money before I come. It's just ego defense after ego. I've seen it over and over it's a de derailing tactic because the ego knows that there's a deep undoing that's being done here and it's tons of unconscious fear comes up. We don't even know why. Okay, my mother gets sick and oh, I've, I have to stay, you know, and it's just all, I've just seen ego tactic after ego tactic. So, you know, you know, I, I know David has said over and over, Every stay is optimal. It doesn't matter if it's two weeks or two years. That's an optimal stay. And the thing that I see uh, is that typically, you know, people come out and there's, there are specific things that they need to work on that they can't get over. Uh, and the spirit sets it up if you come, for instance, for a month, um, that there will be one or two specific deep blocks that will be zeroed in on. And it just happens over and over and over. And just really to come with a willingness to look at whatever is coming up and not to have an expectation about what that is. Sometimes you know, sometimes you have no idea. And just know that it's done in a very loving and gentle manner, even though to the ego sometimes it appears to be a little rough as you found out over the last few days, but it's really as gentle and as quick as it can possibly be. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yes, you, Christian. Thank you.